Hello everyone, it's Eric from Strong Medicine, and today marks the third anniversary of my first video about the novel coronavirus 2019, now known as COVID. I haven't talked about COVID at all on the channel for a while, but the three-year mark of the pandemic, it seems to be a significant milestone to warrant revisiting the disease. And today, I specifically want to discuss the lessons I have learned from COVID. Any discussion of COVID brings up a ton of emotions. I just ask that before you start leaving comments or instinctively upvote or downvote the video, watch and listen. Maybe my take on COVID is predictable at this point, but maybe I'll surprise you with what I'm going to say. Over the last few years, I've seen plenty of folks talking about the lessons of COVID. I'm hardly the first. However, in my opinion, many of these lessons miss the mark. For example, some commenters say things like, public health is underfunded. Well, well yeah, I mean, we, we already knew that. Maybe COVID made it more apparent to the public, but it was hardly secret knowledge of the elite beforehand. Other commenters, less charitably, have used the opportunity, opportunity to say things like, COVID showed us that people are selfish or awful. I understand where that, where that sentiment comes from. I, I really do but it's inflammatory, it's not helpful, and I don't think it's even accurate. Yes, there have been a small handful of true grifters who have knowingly lied and who continue to lie about COVID for monetary gain, yet I think most people are inherently good, and actions that may outwardly appear selfish usually don't originate from a place of selfishness. It's totally fine if you, can, if you disagree with that. You know, People can certainly have different opinions on this, but for me, no, I, I don't think people are selfish is a lesson that I should have learned from COVID or, or that I did learn from COVID. So what have been the lessons? I will focus on two which happen to intersect. First, scientists are terrible at science communication. During the pandemic, physicians and scientists mistakenly believed that if they only presented the facts as they understood them, the public would just accept them. This is how science was communicated throughout the 20th century, often in the form of books, some technical like Feynman lectures on physics, but often layperson friendly like Silent Spring and A Brief History of Time. Occasionally, a scientist might develop an on-camera presence like Carl Sagan in his beloved miniseries Cosmos. But whether Feynman or Sagan, the public trusted these people. You know, the public did not question the motives of scientists or try to correct them. I'm not suggesting this is necessarily the optimal state or that scientists can't or shouldn't be questioned or scrutinized. I'm merely stating that this is how things were in the 20th century where, uh, when science communication was relatively simple. Now, however, we are in a completely different era of how individuals learn, um, how they get information, and how they engage with others. We have social media allowing misinformation and conspiracy theories to flourish, Google is empowering individuals to believe that 10 minutes on the internet can put us on par with a topic expert. And without, you know, without naming anyone in particular, politicians and pundits have leveraged the growing association of political party with a belief in or distrust of science in order to increase their own support with the side effect of changing the public's perception of science, something which is inherently apolitical. And that's not a dig only at Republicans and conservative pundits, because Democrats and liberal pundits have done this too, just in the opposite direction on each issue. Science communication in this environment is completely different than it was decades ago. Before, science communication was seen as an informal and lighthearted outlet for particularly well-spoken scientists to drum up interest in their area of study. However, today, it's no longer sufficient to discuss the application of scientific reasoning to objective observations from a position of authority. You know, the public expects and needs more than that. When crafting their message, the communicator needs to consider not only the audience's scientific literacy, but also their audience's biases, and to be aware of their own biases too. Communicators need to consider the context in which the message is being delivered, how might the message be challenged by online information, including online pseudoscience? Communicators need to anticipate objections, both the reasonable and the absurd, to defend their assertions and conclusions in real time. In short, science communication needs to be considered a separate 
scientific discipline of its own, with a body of research and with standards for the development of expertise in science communication. During the pandemic, there have been plenty of folks who have not understood this. Whether or not you agreed with everything that Anthony Fauci, Rochelle Walensky, and Ashish Jha had to say about COVID, there is no denying that they completely botched the messaging. They botched it so badly with such significant consequences that entire careers could be developed around studying their failure of messaging, particularly on vaccines. Public-facing government scientists, they did not sufficiently anticipate how anti-vaxxers would capitalize on pre-existing anti-government sentiment and anti-science sentiment among conservatives. They didn't consider human psychology when developing their messaging. They discounted reasonable concerns from vaccine skeptics, and they downplayed uncertainties. They didn't anticipate how easily social media allows pseudoscience to spread, and something which they continue to fail to acknowledge even now is how the government's vigorous embrace of vaccinations and therapeutics sometimes outpaced the data and ultimately backfired by sabotaging confidence from the same people they most needed to convince, the prominent vaccine-skeptical voices, including the academic COVID contrarians, who at least initially were far more influential than true anti-vaxxers. Sometimes when this failure of communication is discussed, some people get a little defensive. They'll refer to prominent scientists and physicians they follow on social media who explain things really clearly. But that's missing the whole point. Explaining things really clearly is not sufficient for a topic as loaded and controversial today as COVID. Other people take the defensiveness to the next level and they blame it on the audience, you know, saying the audience was just too brainwashed or too stupid to understand. But that is total nonsense. You know, if you are tasked by your government or institution to convince the public to be vaccinated, and after months of interviews and statements and social media posts, people are even less willing to be vaccinated than before you started, that is on you. Yet, at the same time, there is plenty of blame to go around. This is not just uh, about a couple people at the top. This communication failure was systemic. You know, to be clear, I'm also not saying that the CDC and the FDA have been universally right throughout the last three years because, let's face it, they haven't. If you've watched all my previous COVID videos, you would know that I've expressed skepticism about some treatments and mitigation strategies along the way. But there were things that were clearly important to have convinced the public about, like the initial vaccine series, over which there was a truly epic messaging failure. To show a different perspective on, commu on communication failure, and different types of failure, let me talk about the prominent COVID contrarians I alluded to a minute ago. And, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about all of them. There's, obviously, there's a big range. I'm talking about the academic ones, you know, the, the, the thoughtful folks who come to this discussion from a place of science, irrespective of whether or not you personally agree with them. So people like Vinay Prasad, Jay Bhattacharya, John Ioannidis, uh, Marty Macri, and the like. Right from the outset of the pandemic, these physicians and scientists were already expressing some alternative viewpoints, but they missed an early window of opportunity to foster a productive debate among people with different opinions, but with similar expertise. Ever since then, the contrarians have also struggled with their messaging, but for completely different reasons. In short, instead of, instead of targeting the right audience with the wrong message, like the CDC has been doing, they have been targeting the wrong audience. That is, they've been targeting the audience least in need of their message, conservatives. One of the first influential public statements by scientists during the pandemic was an op-ed in the conservative-leaning Wall Street Journal, co-authored by Bhattacharya, in which it was argued that the infection, infection fatality rate of COVID was dramatically overestimated. And ever since then, they have continued to speak to conservative-leaning media, reached out to Republican politicians, and fostered a strongly conservative and anti-science so, uh, anti social media fan base. This is the complete opposite of who they should have been talking to. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, he doesn't need to be convinced that masks are less effective than the CDC claims. He already believes that. 
The viewers of Fox News already believed that COVID was no longer a public health emergency before Marty Macri came on to talk, uh, to talk to them about it. Seriously, what are these guys doing preaching to the choir? What they are doing is they are solidifying their own fan base. They're increasing their social media clout. They're keeping their dopamine receptors highly active. And in some cases, they're making a lot of money through lucrative Substack subscriptions. I don't mean to uh, sound like I'm harshly judging them. You know, there's nothing wrong with taking personal pride in being interviewed on television uh, or making some supplemental income. But at the same time, the contrarians need to understand that many others see this as an enormous conflict of interest. It creates the perception from the other side that their message is not only biased, but is so biased that it's not worthy of consideration. So now, three years into this, when the contrarians do raise questions and points that are worthy of discussion, which does happen, one side isn't interested. Of course, like everything COVID-related, it is more complicated than this. For example, uh, Bhattacharya, uh, he's claimed that he's, uh, he's been deplatformed from Twitter, uh, which would deny him the opportunity to fairly engage the other side. He's also very publicly complained about not being asked to speak on COVID at academic grand rounds, including at our, our mutual institution of Stanford. But you know, those things only happened after he had already moved rightward. Um, with Prasad, you know, I've heard him praise open dialogue and the concept of the marketplace of ideas, and he has repeatedly decried censorship of alternative viewpoints on social media, which, you know, I can respect that, that viewpoint. You know, even if I support more limitations than he does, like, I respect what he says, like, about that. I mean, I think he's, he's got a good point. But if you look at his own Twitter feed, and in particular comments on his own YouTube channel, there is no healthy debate going on there. What you find instead is an endless stream of unsupported anti-vax and anti-government nonsense that, as far as I can tell, he never once corrects, even when I am sure that he disagrees with them. If a commenter were to respectfully push back against Prasad's ideas on those platforms, they would be castigated into oblivion by his legions of fans. You know, so if an I, you need to correct misinformation posted by your own followers and subscribers, despite it alienating some of them. Even if the content of your videos is accurate and thoughtful, you have a responsibility to ensure that your own comment section is not itself a platform for conspiracies and pseudoscience, which negates the good you are trying to do. Ultimately, the communication failures of the contrarians might look completely different and might have a completely different pathogenesis as compared to those of the medical establishment, but failures on both sides could have been mitigated with a better understanding of science communication. You need the right message delivered to the right audience at the right time. This brings me to the second lesson I learned from COVID. We are all prone to bias. In the case of COVID, the most prominent bias, a form of bias, has been confirmation bias. When a new study comes out about the vaccine or masks or current COVID death certificates or whatever, uh, death statistics or whatever, uh, the greatest predictor of how a person will interpret that information is what they already believe about it. This is as true for physicians reading the primary literature as it is for laypersons watching a television news story. During the pandemic, there have been papers published in which different physicians and different scientists reach literal opposite conclusions as to what the takeaway take message should be. There have been plenty of times in which someone has comically exaggerated a benefit of questionable clinical relevance seen in a trial or has downplayed very real shortcomings in a trial's methodology. That happened uh, very early on with hydroxychloroquine and later with ivermectin, and it happened with remdesivir and masks and the vaccine boosters. To be fair, when I say everyone is biased, uh, biased, that doesn't mean that everyone is equally biased. For example, Anthony Fauci is not equally biased as Robert Malone. It also doesn't mean that the bias in one person is equally prominent in all situations and at all times. For example, a person could have modest bias when talking about vaccines and dramatic bias when talking about masks. As a viewer of this video, you could reasonably ask here, wasn't the fact that we are all biased, you know, sort of known before COVID? <laughs> yes, of course it was known before COVID, but our biases became much more prominent when the stakes were high and when so many of us, including scientists, seemed to live or die by 
our social media clout, and our online reputation. Scientists and physicians have tried really hard to believe it wasn't true, that bias is not a problem that we, the purveyors of objective truth, suffer from. Yet throughout COVID, I've seen otherwise completely reasonable people and excellent physicians make unreasonable and unsupported statements about the effectiveness, or lack thereof, of a variety of COVID-related interventions. Interestingly, interestingly, in the majority of cases, Prasad being one of the more notable exceptions, the bias is in the direction of certainty, asserting something as truth when in reality there's not enough evidence to draw a firm conclusion. Why does this happen? Well, uncertainty makes people uncomfortable. And because the public doesn't like uncertainty, among those scientists and physicians who are public figures and active on social media, those who make the most certain sounding claims usually gain more followers, more clout, and more visibility, thus contributing to the illusion that many of these questions about COVID are more settled than they actually are, which in turn becomes yet one more form of science communication failure and underemphasis on uncertainty. Before closing out, there is one last thing I want to uh, address, and that is when I say everyone is biased, I am most definitely including myself. You know, I try to mitigate my biases in part by thinking about how I reach conclusions and considering where my biases might come from. I try to actively seek out a diversity of opinions on issues. For example, when I had been on Twitter, I deliberately followed some accounts with which I often disagreed because they sometimes made good points that I otherwise would have missed. And even when I disagreed with their points, it was important to learn what their beliefs were and how they got there, how they, they, how they generate those beliefs. And it was helpful when people pushed back on my own claims and assertions. For one, I could be wrong, and you know I need to be respectfully uh, corrected. And two, even when I remained unconvinced by the other side, being forced to defend a position can help you understand your belief in that position better, provided that you do so thoughtfully and you don't just reflexively reject the counter-arguments. Overall, avoiding echo chambers and groupthink is critically important. It's important in science, and it's important in life more generally. Plus, even if some degree of bias inevitably remains, working to understand other perspectives makes one a better communicator as well. And connecting this back to science communication some more, the most effective communicators are the ones who demonstrate an acceptance that they have their own biases by acknowledging value and potential correctness in other viewpoints. For example, I might have a set of beliefs on masking as it relates to COVID. This set of beliefs includes the degree of benefit I believe masks have or don't have, in what situation that applies, the differences between mask types, and how objective data on masks should interface with community values to create public policy. I have a set of beliefs about this, but I accept that there is a spectrum of beliefs to either side of me on, on, on the set of questions that reasonable people can reasonably hold. It's like having a point estimate surrounded by a confidence interval. But as with a confidence interval, it is possible that the truth lies outside what I perceive as reasonable. In other words, there is what I believe to be true, what others might reasonably believe to be true, and what is theoretically possible. The best science communicators understand the existence of those boundaries, how their biases might influence how they define them, and how their audience compares to themselves. So that's all I wanted to say today, you know, three years after I started talking and thinking about COVID. I suspect there was something in there to upset pretty much everyone, but I also hope that everyone found something I said that resonated with your own experience and your, and your own viewpoints. And if I did say something that would respectfully question an idea or belief you currently accept as true, I hope you don't see that as a bad thing. We all need to be better at leaning into respectful disagreement instead of rejecting it. Otherwise, we will continue to talk past each other on these kinds of issues. And I think one thing we can all agree on is that the next global crisis we collectively face could be much worse than COVID has been. Anyway, please leave your thoughts and comments below. Dissenting opinions are definitely welcome. But as always, Comments that are overtly inflammatory or overtly disrespectful, regardless of the target, will be removed. And I'll be back in a few days 
uh, with some more uh, conventional medical videos.